Now, we've all heard of halal organ harvesting, where the organs of Uyghur Muslims are sold to the highest bidders in the Middle East by the Chinese communist regime. So it shouldn't come as a surprise when we find out that the Chinese are now profiting from the hair of the Uyghurs who have been detained in Chinese concentration camps. Now, the Chinese are actually not the first to profit from the hair of concentration camp detainees. We know that this actually happened in Nazi Germany. A report back in 2009 details that, that a German car our parts supplier was accused of using the hair of from at least 40,000 Auschwitz death camp prisoners to make textiles at its factories in Nazi-occupied Poland during the Second World War. China is the largest exporter of hair in the world, supplying more than 80% of hair-based products. Now, the increase in hair production corresponds with the opening of the concentration camps. Between 2009 and 2018, the market for hair products went from 100 million US dollars per year to 1.8 billion dollars by the end of 2019. So you can see that this is another way that the Chinese regime profits off the byproduct of these detainees. For Uyghur women to have long hair is an important part of Uyghur culture and traditions. The factories that process these hair products have former detainees from concentration camps work in these factories as forced labor and reports tell us that they work anywhere between 20 to 22 hours a day for 70 US dollars. So they're not just selling the hair of the Uyghurs but they are also forcing Uyghurs to process the hair which is just sickening. A classic example of kicking someone while they're down. According to testimonials of at least 10 female former concentration camp detainees, they've said that their heads were shaved as soon as they entered into those concentration camps. These detainees put their heads through a hole and they don't actually see the barber that is shaving their heads. Boycott any hair products that are made in China. Share this video if you are against slave labor and do your bit to stop this modern day 21st century genocide, this Uyghur Holocaust, this Muslim Holocaust, which is unbelievable, sickening, horrific to say the least. Assalamu alaikum, dear brothers and sisters. We have another live show for you today. Today I have a very special guest, an award winning China analyst and human rights investigator. investigator. Um, he is a research fellow in China studies for the victims of communism memorial foundation and the author of losing the new China and the slaughter. Um, he has also written for publications such as the wall street, uh, journal, Asia, the weekly standard national review, the investors, uh, the investors business daily while providing testimony and briefings to the United States Congress the CIA, the European Parliament, the United Nations, and the parliaments of Ottawa, Canberra, Dublin, Jerusalem, Prague, Edinburgh, and London. A former foreign policy analyst at the Brookings Institution, Ethan Goodman has appeared on PBS, CNN, BBC, and CNBC. He was also nominated for the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize. I would like to welcome Ethan Goodman. Delighted to well, be here, Arslan. It's great to see you. Thank you for sharing your time with us to highlight exactly one of these issues today, which is the hair from what possibly could be from former female Uyghur de concentration camp detainees. Um, and we're obviously going to be talking about the various articles that have been posted on this issue, your view on it. But specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, Gujikita Hodges' article from Radio Free Asia. Welcome to the show. Uh, Gulchara has been doing this for a while. She has been looking at this story. We're often in touch. We are friends. We talk together. We try out ideas on each other. Uh, this was one that is a no-brainer. Okay, this is the... I was picking this up. I have been uh, interviewing uh, Uyghur and Kazakh refugees and even some Kyrgyz refugees for uh, about a year now, just over a year, actually. And we, uh, one of the first things that I ran into with female former camp victims, you know, camp detainees, was uh, they were asked to put their head in a hole. They had to kind of wait in line and then put their head in a hole. You don't see 
uh, this was a fairly traumatic experience because several of them acted it out for me. Uh, and, you know, sort of put their head in the hole and then the, the, the hair gets shaved and uh, they have no idea who's doing it uh, and how it's happening, uh, what it's being used for. Uh, but obviously, you know, this is one of these things that, uh, you know, you would think would be minor in, in this you know, concentration camp like these. Uh, but in fact, it's, it's pretty damaging to female identity. Uh, you know, if you combine what we've been learning this week through uh, the Adrian Zenz report about uh, the sterilizations, uh, this is an attack on the women of the Uyghur women, and the Kazakh women, and the Kyrgyz and the Hui. Uh, it's a destruction of who they are. It's a destruction of their ability to reproduce. It's a destruction of their femininity. Uh, is and it obviously left a kind of a, a very traumatic trail along with it. Uh, I, I must say this is one of the only areas right now where we can sort of say, look, this is an unabashed victory because of what just happened. Uh, I guess uh, two days ago was the customs seized 13 tons of human hair wigs from a Chinese company. I'm not, the name escapes you right at the moment, but you probably have it up on the screen. Uh, now, the... 13 tons, as I calculated, back of the envelope calculation, I'm not saying this is absolute, is about, represents about 75,000 to 90,000 heads of hair. On these women. That's a lot of, that's a lot of people. Uh, that's a lot of women. And the, the hair is prized because it is not, Han Chinese hair is uh, very predictable or very, uh, very specific. It's it's black. It's 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 tends to be rather thin. Uh, Uyghur hair is is genetically different. It is uh, it is thicker. It is often colored. It's a chestnut brown. It's it's got red highlights. It's got all all these things that are very very desirable uh, throughout the Western world, ranging from somebody who's black or Latino to 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 Orthodox Jews. I mean, it's it's just one of these things. These are the prime. And there's no insult to those communities. These are. Uh, people who wear wigs, that's all they did along with fairly wealthy people. But uh, and it's in their culture to do so. They don't know anything about this. They're not responsible for this. But the Chinese uh, market in human hair wigs has exploded in the last three years. Uh, and, and I think you mentioned this in your intro. Uh, you, I don't have a, I'll do the chart for you. I mean, they're just tandem lines, uh, tandem lines going uh, rising like this, and that is the the amount of people in the camps, which really picked up in 2016, uh, and the amount of human hair wigs that have come out. There's no other way this can be really. I, I can't see another explanation for what's going on here. Uh, I mean, we've just got the figures here of the money that's involved. We're talking anywhere uh, between 2019 to 18 around 100 million dollars. And with the most recent figures, close to $2 billion. How do you see or how do you see, um, say, Western companies affecting uh, the change? Could, because obviously governments cannot, um, human rights organizations seem not to be able to. How, what is the effect of private enterprise when it comes to their direct or indirect involvement? regarding these concentration camps or forced labor camps? Well, there are several areas. I mean, look, this is, uh, let's put it this way. Let's leave the hair aside for a second. What I know from my own interviews is that there are two types of people who disappear from the camps. That's the ones I'm particularly interested in, is the people uh, who disappear. Uh, and half of them are about uh, approximately 18 years old, 17, 18. Uh, they graduate. That's what they say. They even announce it at, at, at lunch sometimes. I mean, you know, it's, there's, there's nobody can talk to each other, but they do make these announcements. They sort of say so and so and so and so are graduating. They're going off to work at such and such a factory. Sometimes they name it, sometimes they don't. Uh, but they're going off to work. And that's plausible that they are going off to work uh, in many cases. Uh, the uh, Because we know that the Uyghur slave labor is a huge component of the economy now. And we know that partly through a, a study which came out in your own country, uh, in Australia, uh, a remarkable, remarkably well put together study 
which fingered two companies in particular and probably ones that they thought would make the most news. But nonetheless, I think there's, there's some truth in there, uh, having read the report pretty carefully. Uh, one was Nike. Uh, the other was Apple. Now, Apple, let's go with Apple for a little while, because Nike's always been a perennial leftists love to attack Nike for some reason. I don't know. It's a kind of a cult of attacking that company. Uh, I also used to represent Nike when I was a business consultant at Beijing sometimes. I have sort of a soft spot for them. But Apple in particular has a big problem because they led... Uh, their working conditions led to a lot of early deaths for people because of the ski, cleansing the screens. Okay, the final cleansing of the screens has to be done with a fairly harsh chemical. I don't have to get into all the details, but basically it leads to terrible cancers and, 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 and awful results and people, uh, brain damage. Uh, very young people who came down with this. So Apple supposedly had cleaned up their act. Of course, it was the same old thing. It was like, well, we're not doing it. It's, you know, the, the people we've hired have, have done it. Uh, that's the, yes, that's the report. And, uh, you know, now that we find out that, you know, who's back doing the, the dangerous stuff? The Uyghurs. Okay. So young Uyghurs, people who have all their lives ahead of them, right? Young women, 18 years old, that kind of thing. So that is a tragedy. Now let's go to the second group. The second group has no reason to be graduating because they're very different. First of all, they're very different age. They tend to be about, on average, according to my witnesses, some people say, well, they're 25 to 35. Some people say, well, they're sort of around 30, maybe a little younger. Basically, the average age is just about 28 or 29. Do you know what the preferred age is for uh, organ harvesting in China? And this is across the board. No. 28 years old. 28 years old is the preferred age this is a, a a constant drumbeat in the Chinese medical journals. You see this everywhere. Okay, so we can say uh, with some confidence, uh, you know, these people, uh, their suspicion regarding their disappearances. Uh, the reason why they like organs at that age is because your body has fully matured, but you you really haven't started to deteriorate. You're at the peak of your health, uh, and so the organs are extremely desirable. The amount of people there, I do not have a count for the amount of people who graduate who are 18, but I do have a count for the uh, for that latter group, the 28, approximately 28 year olds. Oh, and by the way, I'd always ask this single question when I was talking to a witness. I'd say, look, especially if it was a female, I'd say, look, this is an embarrassing question. I don't like to ask it, but were these women who disappeared in the middle of the night, were they attractive? Were they sexually attractive? And they'd come back, this happened again and again, they'd come back and say, um, this is uh, kind of rude to say, but no, they weren't particularly attractive. And I'd say but to one of them, I said, well, how would you describe them? It was the commonality. They said they were healthy. Uh, so that's what we're looking at is healthy the people. These are healthy organs. They're repositories for healthy organs. Uh, this is uh, this is where we you know go into the area of bad science fiction. Except that, of course, the Chinese have admitted they were doing this with regular prisoners for years, uh, and the only thing they've denied is that they're doing it with prisoners of conscience, religious prisoners, political prisoners, and so forth. Uh, and when you look at the overall picture of the camps and the amount of rape uh, that's going on in the camps, which is uh, even as somebody who studied Falun Gong for years, it's kind of unprecedented. Uh, there are stories I can't get out of my mind. Now, you know, when you look at those, that picture, you see lives that have been so deeply devalued, uh, where it's clearly not just an ideological initiative by the state, but a, a racial a kind of ethnic cleansing and attack on the race. Uh, now, if, that's, if, that's, that's just what we're looking at very clearly, and clearly the Uyghurs have become the new Falun Gong in terms of being the victims of organ harvesting. I don't think there's a lot of 28 year old Falun Gong on the ground. I think they're thin on the ground in China today. Uh, but, but this is an enormous population, uh, completely surrounded, utterly, the surveillance is total. They cannot stay in touch with their families. There's no communication. These people can safely disappear off the face of the earth. Their bodies burnt in crematoriums, the DNA utterly destroyed. 
and we've also seen the destruction of cemeteries. So this is uh, the crime of crimes. You know, I don't like to use, use the word genocide. It's so loaded, but. Um, you've obviously uh, worked very closely with a man who actually ended up uh, in the 90s performing one of these uh, organ harvesting, Mr. Anwar Tohti. Uh, we've heard his testimony uh, many times in various articles on television. Here's what he had to say um, a few years ago on a panel, which you were also on, uh, uh, Ethan. Ireland. Ireland. Yeah, in Ireland. So I'll play that for you now, and then I'll get your thoughts on it. And I'll, and uh, for the viewers watching, if you do have any questions uh, for Mr. Ethan Goodman, please leave them here, and I'll try and uh, put them in. Let's hear what Mr. Um, Anamar Tohti had to say, uh, one of the surgeons who actually was forced to take part in, in such uh, atrocities. During my time in our outpatient department that I have seen at least three children had a scar on their body, indicates the organ had been stolen. And in 1995, it comes to my turn to do it. It was a Wednesday. My two chief surgeons called me into the office and told me to assemble a team with capability of the largest possible surgery and report to them next day morning. 9.30 next day, we met at the hospital gate and headed towards the Western Mountain Execution Ground, where I was told to wait for them until hearing the gunshots. After gunshots were heard, we rushed in. An armed officer directed us to the far right corner, where I can see a civilian clothed man lying on the ground with a single bullet wound to his right chest. My chief surgeon then ordered me, ordered and guided me, extracted the liver and the two kidneys. The man was alive. He tried to resist, resist my scalpel cut, but too weak to avoid my action. There was bleeding. He was still alive, but I didn't feel guilty. In fact, I didn't feel anything but like a full programmed robot doing its task. I thought I was carrying my duty to eliminate the, eliminate the enemy of the state. After operation, those chief surgeons took these <clears throat> organs with two strange looking boxes and they told me to take my team back to the hospital and remember there was nothing happened and I followed order. We never talked about it. It is not acceptable that a normal buy one get one free shopping pattern can be seen in organ transplantation. Pre-date for your heart transplantation means that they, have, they make someone dead for you. Giving away organs to promote business means to have organ of plenty. Unlimited supply of organs only can be achieved if those organs are carried in the living body waiting to be taken on demand. A news broke out last June that CCP is giving Uyghur people in Xinjiang free national health checkup with no explanation why. So we suspect that the CCP is building the national database for organ trade. It is also widely reported that CCP is carrying a DNA test in the region under the glorified of improving the quality of the life of Uyghurs. And that is, I believe, it's a lie. Thank you. Um, very sinister. Um, it's, it's sickening to hear words like buy one, get one free uh, phrased into there, um, like what you're just buying uh, a couch or a pillow or a fridge or headphones or, um, you know, you, you, you work closely with Mr. Anubar Tohti. Could, could, you, could you tell us uh, a bit more, um, Haida, what sort of he went through um, and yeah. what you investigated? Yeah. Well, what happened, I mean, Enver Tote uh, actually spontaneously confessed to this, which he had never confessed to before, as far as I know, to anyone, uh, when I was giving a talk at Westminster in London, which is where I live most of the time. And I, I apparently said something like, somebody was sort of saying, you know, you don't have that much proof or something. I said, well, look, it's hard to get doctors to talk about this. And... Uh, you know, there's so many inhibitions and their families are often come under jeopardy. And then he raised his hand and said, I don't have a question. I did this with my own hands. Uh, it was a remarkable moment. I'll never forget it. And I 
if, I, if memory serves, I said, can I ask you the questions from this point on? And he proceeded to tell the story in a fairly halting way. His English wasn't nearly as good back then, uh, some years ago. Uh, the, I believe it was, what, 2009 or so. Uh, the, put him in front of a camera with my uh, colleague, Jaya Gibson, and a very good cameraman, Simon Gross, and they spoke to him, and he made a full confession of a couple of hours. It's very different from how he tells the story now. I don't mean that the story is inconsistent. What I mean is that one's views about these things somewhat changes over time. Uh, different aspects of it come out. I've heard him give that, because he's asked to, I've heard him give that confession so many times. And each time I learned something new, which is kind of remarkable. But so, for example, uh, he pointed out, and I'd never known this before. He said this, the man's wounds were survivable. This man could have been, could have lived. I mean, he had been shot in the chest, but not lethally, or not by today's standards. He could have recovered. But instead, he took out his organs. The guy dies. Okay. That is something, and that's just one man's story. And clearly, when they looked at Enver, uh, they were trying him out for a position because there are surgeons all over China, we know their names, who do this regularly. Okay, do a couple of operations like this every week. Uh, and the, you know, clearly it doesn't bother them or they somehow learn to live with it and work with it. And obviously there was something unsteady about Enver. Okay, so they never asked him to do it again. It was like a trial. We failed that job application, if you like. Uh, Essentially, um, he, you know, he said... I, I'll add something, one more thing I've never said. Yeah. Denver could have been a very rich man. Yeah. Denver thought he could have been. He's not wealthy. Uh, he lives on the east side of London. We hang out. His, apartment, his flat's pretty small. Uh, he could have been a wealthy man if he had shown a little more uh, backbone when he was cutting these, showing no sign of disturbance, no sign of psychological disturbance. He did. Of course, that speaks for him. Essentially, um, I mean, everyone's heard it. Um, the, he said he acted like a robot, and, and, that, and that's, that's the point of the CCP. They, they break the, any sort of human down to a shell and then just feed them CCP propaganda turn them into robots, and people will literally do anything. Um, what Do you have any numbers? I mean, uh, here's an article uh, by C.J. Werleman, and he actually interviewed uh, Dr. Anna Tokti on this matter, and hopefully I'm going to have him in about 10 hours or so. Um, do you have any numbers as to the number of uh, actual organ transplantations, illegal organ transplantations that are taking place in China, uh, or even this halal Muslim, halal yeah. organ harvesting issue. Let me give you a couple of ones that I'm very sure about, okay? Um, yeah. And I'm not going to give, the, the, we, we don't have time to get into all the disputed ones or ones where I think something, to, look, there are about 75,000 and possibly as high as 100,000 transplants per year in China. That is how many organs get transplanted. That is far above America, which is more like 30,000, okay, 35,000. Uh, it's three times, approximately three times the size. Uh, the Chinese denied this number, but it doesn't matter because we've counted up all the hospitals and the hospitals can, for years could not help bragging about how many transplants they're doing, okay? Uh, they just, and this has always been China's biggest weakness is the bragging. You've seen it yourself. You've looked into the, uh, the numbers on the concentration camps, same thing, okay? We didn't have good figures on those concentration camps. We had some Google Earth images. But thanks to the Public Security Bureau of China, they couldn't resist saying, you know, oh, you've only got 10% of the, the Uyghur males in Arumchi. We're Khatan and we've got 40%. Okay. This is the saving grace for researchers uh, all over the world because the Chinese, the, 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 something in the Chinese culture cannot resist saying we overproduced, right? You know, we're, <laughs> unbelievable bumper harvest. Okay, so we know that it's about seventy-five thousand. Now, how how are they getting those organs? Well, you can get obviously six organs out of a human being easily, uh, but it's not that easy. It's hard to line them up with other people. 
but you have to have a source. Uh, it turns out that the voluntary donations, which they were claiming could possibly be as high, you know, lead up to about 40,000. Uh, it turns out that number was completely made up. It was actually based on an equation, a very simple equation, which is supposed to show a nice curve. Okay. Uh, and so the chances of that being a real number, a perfect curve, a parabolic curve, impossible. Okay. It's basically, you know, you'd get thrown out of a court of law with that one. So what are we left with? We're left with the Uyghurs. And my estimate, and I get this, and I, I think I'm the only person in the world, not to brag here, but who can make this estimate, because I have probably talked to more uh, people from the camps uh, than anyone else, because I've talked to the Kazakhs as well as the Uyghurs, yeah? which more than doubles the number, triples it, and quadruples it, really. Uh, now, the Kazakhs aren't treated that badly in camp, but they're very observant people. Okay, they're not treated as badly as the Uyghurs. They're probably not under the same danger of being organ harvested in many cases. But they are very observant. They watch things very carefully. And based on what they have told me, and they all come from different camps, I've been able to generate numbers. And the lowest number, the minimum number I can come up with, is that 25,000 uh, human beings, mostly Uyghurs, but probably a few Kyrgyz and Kazakh, and Maine and Hui, uh, are being used for their organs every year in the camps, okay? Now that might vary from one year to another. That might be 30,000 one year and 20,000 another. That's not my concern here. My concern is to get us in a ballpark number and I think it's about 25,000. And that may means that since the beginning of the camps, uh, we're looking at something just approaching 100,000 now, 100,000 human beings. Now, you can argue about whether or not all of these people who disappeared in the middle of the night who happened to be just around 28 years old, that they were off to be you know, I mean, maybe if a few were picked as sex slaves, I don't know. But the fact is, uh, I believe that number is low. And I believe it fits very easily with what I just told you, which is about 75,000. That means you need about three organs per person. This solves the entire problem. And there's one final thing, and you mentioned it already, which is the halal organ issue. Now, that phrase, I don't know if it's really used, okay? I want to preface my remarks by saying that. I mean, I've heard that phrase bandied about. I've never seen an advertisement, mm -hmm. you know, in Arabic or any other language which sort of says halal organs for sale. I don't think that's the point. I think the point is we know what we're talking about here. We're saying that to a strict Muslim, the idea of eating some, uh, the idea of uh, getting an organ, which from somebody who eats pork is not an attractive idea, okay? And getting an organ from somebody who does not eat pork and maybe he doesn't even drink or smoke, uh, is much more appealing. And I don't think there's any question about that, because we know from the beginning of the largest hospital in China that does transplants, largest in the world, I should say, Changjin Central, approximately 5,000 transplants per year in a single hospital. Uh, we know that right from the beginning, go back four or five years, and they were already, uh, you had a choice when you entered that website, English or Arabic. Wow. Okay. So the fact is that we know that uh, Changjin Central since then has been investigated by two reporters. One was a terrible reporter from the Washington Post who was trying to debunk the entire organ harvesting story. <laughs> uh, but he stumbled into the fact that there were a lot of people from the Gulf states there. In fact, it was mainly people from the Gulf states who were waiting for organs inside Changjin Central, which was illegal. OK, that's illegal. You're not supposed to do organ tourism in China anymore. OK, uh, the other was a uh, documentary filmmaker who I've gotten to know uh, from South Korea, who just came in with his, his secret cameras and filmed all this. And uh, you can clearly see for yourself. This is uh, you can tell from the languages you're hearing in the background. This is his Gulf states. OK, so we know that that's there. We know it's a big part of this. And we also anyone who has been following the politics of this thing knows the remarkable, remarkable rejection that the Uyghur cause has been met with from uh, just a terrible apathy and even worse, uh, what I'd call quizzling, you know, a double cross. I mean, literally, you know, statements coming out from Saudi Arabia and so forth saying, oh, China's doing the right thing. I mean, this is remarkable. It's it, 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 When you go back a few years, I'm, I'm in touch with the Uyghur community. I, I go to conferences. I hang out with Uyghurs a lot socially and uh, uh, 
And, you know, I remember how high the hopes were that, you know, we weren't just, not just that they had some friends in Washington, National Endowment for Democracy, places like that, uh, but that they had some friends in the Middle East. And those never came about. It, it just, they, 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 that cavalry never arrived. Uh, and that is a great tragedy. And I believe that this halal organs uh, issue is part of that. You see, you know, as well as anyone, that this is about once your own hands get dirty, it's very hard to get them clean again. It's very hard to pull away from that force. Uh, people become implicated. And nobody wants to open up this can of worms. Okay, They don't want to open it up in Saudi Arabia because it'll lead to some very, very wealthy and very powerful and important and, and respected people. Uh, and this has been a problem in societies across the world. It was a problem in Taiwan, a terrible problem in Taiwan. It still is. Okay. Uh, you know, there are rumors about the president of the country. I mean, you know, uh, there, there are rumors uh, all over the place about this. I don't know what's true and what's not. That's not my job to go out and muck rake and make people, uh, particularly people who are trying to save relatives, you know, put them into misery. But that's not the point of this story. The point of this story is to just expose the truth. But if you're looking for an explanation of why people do nothing, this is part of it. Uh, could you uh, could you help us? Uh, could you explain to us how do we decipher what's true and what's not false? Obviously, as you mentioned, it's very difficult to get uh, proof out um, because you know freedom of media, lack of social media. I mean, it's not like Myanmar or Syria or Palestine, where people are just taking images willy-nilly and um, putting things online. Um, yeah. And we really do have to rely a lot on witness testimony. Um, how do you decipher what's true and what's not? Well, I think there's two ways. First of all, I don't work by myself. I work with, uh, you know, I've written my own books and so forth, but I did was the co-founder of a coalition, the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China. That's filled with some great researchers. Uh, uh, David Matus, one of the preeminent lawyers, human rights lawyers in the world today, who done fantastic stuff. Uh, Matthew Robertson, brilliant analyst on this. Uh, several other people who are, there, you know, uh, I work at VOC. You've got Adrian Zentz there. I mean, you've got some terrific people working on these issues. And I pay very close attention to documents. And indeed, I, I wrote some of this stuff myself about the hospital transplant volume that we talked about, 60,000 to 100,000 and so forth, and how, how big the transplant volume was in any given year. And having said that, uh, I'm never happy with that. Okay, I need to smell somebody. I need to smell whether they're credible or not. Now, I do take witnesses and I, I think this is one of the big mistakes we make in the world today is sort of trusting idiot, idiotic things on the Internet or trusting Chinese documents, which are all over the place uh, and are almost always political. Even the ones that get exposed uh, later on, even the ones that are like, oh, they didn't want this to come out. They have a political meaning, too, within the Chinese Communist Party. So they're not always that accurate. So I think we have to get back to this idea that witnesses are valuable, even though they're biased, even though they have a grudge, even though they went gone through terrible pain and some, some things are very distorted. But you can get around that if you will just show the patients to come to where they are and sit down with them and say the magic words, which are, tell me about your childhood, okay? In other words, don't just tell me about being a victim, tell me who you are, start with that. Rediscover yourself when you talk to me. This is really essential, okay, that, that, that we go back to those basic human <laughs> modes of communication. And that is the only way I can get judge whether somebody's uh, sincere, whether the story is real or not. And then I, the other thing is don't push them. Don't ask them to tell you the numbers of people in the camps. They can't do that. They were, they were seeing a very small section. You have to ask very, very tiny questions. What was it like in your cell block? Who were the other people in that cell block? Do you remember any of them? Do you remember any names? Do you remember any distinctive characteristics? Uh, all the things that lead into a real story. You don't even have to ask them whether they think organ harvesting is going on. That's not necessary. The idea is here just to collect the facts. If they think organ harvesting is going on, they'll probably tell you. 
if they didn't want to think about it, then they didn't want to think about it. That's okay too. They had a lot on their minds. Um, so I think, you know, that is a really important method. And that's why I uh, went to Kazakhstan uh, just before the gates of COVID-19, the Wuhan virus closed on us. I got to Kazakhstan and back. And the way I did that was by driving uh, to the country as opposed to taking a plane where I would have been uh, flagged at the airport and they would have at least put a tail on me, uh, you know, or some sort of virus on my computer and so forth. So I decided the best way to do this was sort of pose as a skier and go with my daughter, who's this attractive 24 year old blonde and uh, drive there in a car, which had no, uh, which had four wheel drive, but it had, it was old enough that it had no internet connectivity. And then we turned off all the devices once we got to the border of Kazakhstan of this Crimean Sea. And we drove to Almaty <laughs> from there. We started from Germany. <laughs> it was insane drive, but it was really well worth doing, I think, because I could say with confidence, I'm not being followed, right? Uh, and I could say that to the witnesses because it wasn't my protection I was worried about. In fact, if they'd arrested me or, you know, put a tail on me, well, that's a good story. You know, you could dine out on that one for years to come, uh, you know, a couple of nights in Kazakh jail, come on. No, that, that wasn't the issue. The issue was, can I protect these witnesses? They have family still back in the camps. If they will need to be completely anonymous, be completely anonymous. I said, you know, I have two choices. I have an electronic device, which means it will be on a hard drive. I said, or I have this dictaphone from 40 years ago. <laughs> Do you want to use the, It's your choice. If you want to use the dictaphone, that's fine. If you want to say, I don't want me to reveal where this interview was done, we can do that. Okay. I said, I probably need to reveal your sex. I'll give you any name you like. Okay. Your story is the most important thing to me. You see what I'm getting at? I mean, this is the, that's the, I think what's sort of been the forgotten art in this world. Uh, the internet cloaks this because we seem to have so much information at our fingertips and we want everything done quickly. But in fact, yep. yeah. Uh, basically, what well, I've just found some footage that I had, I think I believed I shared a good year ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it's basically hospital footage. Now, anyone that knows this channel oh, knows that China um, China is very much, you know, it, even the notion of halal food, mosques, um, any, 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 any promotion of Islam is absolutely banned, but this is a hospital essentially built for their Middle Eastern rich Arab guests to get, you know, they don't actually openly say, you know, they're organ transplanting, but this setup tells us a lot. Let's have a listen to this. Essentially, it's a promotional video. Have a listen to this, guys, and tell us what you think. And I would like your opinion on this as well, Ethan. Just let me get the sound up. Um, I'll, I'll just get your thoughts on this a bit now. I'm just going to uh, re... i got to do something here. But okay, yeah. No uh, the, one of the interesting things uh, is that we don't have a tape like this uh, concerning another very important hospital in China, but I'll just mention it. Yeah. Because one of the biggest groups that gets organs in China is uh, the Japanese. And they wow. actually have a special hospital, the J China Japan Friendship Hospital, wow. where Japanese food is served and uh, all the nurses speak Japanese and, and the rest of it. Okay, so that I think will inform this this video, which I've just seen briefly before. Okay, I'll, I'll put it on now. I've got it up. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Candy. Right now, I am in Beijing Tongshan Town Hospital uh, for traditional Chinese herbal medicine. Now we are in the second floor. Here is the prayer room. That will be the area for all those Muslim patients. When they come here, they will pray.
So you can have a look. In the second floor, we also have a very big resting area. This is after the patients finish praying. They also can sit here. They can drink some coffee. They can talk in and relax themselves. Behind me, there is a Muslim canteen. So for all those Muslim patients, they can enjoy their food during the hospitalization in China. So I just realized that my mic was muted a moment ago. What I was saying before was a mosque within a hospital. I mean, from my experience in East Turkestan, there are no hospitals with mosques inside them, um, let alone a halal Muslim canteen, halal canteen within a hospital, uh, you know, quarters. And what are they doing there? They are speaking Arabic. And we all know it's been clearly documented, speaking, learning Arabic, uh, are one of the reasons why people end up in concentration camps. Um, what are your thoughts on this? I, I, I think the video speaks for itself. I really do. I mean, this is, as I said, I wish we had one that was very similar for the J China Japan Friendship Hospital because it would show you how the Chinese have catered to these major populations. The disturbing part of this is that we did not have this before fully. And we didn't. We don't think that it was coming. Uh, a lot of the organ tourists are coming from the Gulf states. We know that Germany is the biggest in Europe. Okay, if you're looking for a state in Germany who's really sending people over, it's Germany. Uh, we know that the South Koreans punch way above their weight. Okay, that they are, uh, and it's set up by the hospitals. Okay, hospital to hospital in uh, South Korea. We know the Japanese go over as tour groups. We know the Germans do it through a heart surgeon network. Uh, it's been long developed. Uh, we know that the Taiwanese just go to Google and you start comparing prices and all that kind of thing. Uh, the, but you know, obviously if you're coming from the Middle East, you're gonna want some of these things. Uh, it's going to make your experience completely different. And when you think about it, it's a triviality. But this is something we did in our own studies, was we showed the opulence of a lot of these hospitals. Some of them have grand pianos that they claim are worth half a million dollars, this kind of thing. I mean, it's insane. Uh, the, the level of luxury is very high. We looked into a British architectural firm, uh, a UK rider uh, healthcare, which was... Uh, was known because they built a hospital for victims of torture and they'd also built this very green hospital in, in, in britain uh but they also were building the largest uh the largest ever uh medical compound in dalian which includes an organ harvesting center and a recovery center very similar very similar kind of uh outlier except it's probably even larger uh, who's that for is that going to be catering just you know, there are a lot of questions about this. I don't want to get too far away from the victims, though. As much as it's fascinating to look at these people who are coming in uh, and to get the organs, they're, they're held at arm's length. It's a little bit like prostitution, okay, uh, or, or something like that. It's, 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 it's not clear that these are really, or drug addicts maybe would be a better comparison. Are drug addicts really culpable? Well, sort of. But you really want to send them all off to jail? No, they're not. They're kind of the victims of this crime. There's, there's the pusher out there. There's the people who are dealing the drugs. Mm. This is somewhat similar. The, the people who are coming in are desperate. And they're desperate to extend their lives. And they're desperate to extend a relative life. And uh, I have sympathy with that. I have an old girlfriend in, in Australia. Uh, uh, so really, I'm very glad to see she's still alive. If she, got, uh, she would have died if she hadn't gotten in there later. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a miracle. It's a miracle that she's alive. She because she got it perfectly legally. I want to say that, but uh, yeah. I have my cousin uh, received a new lung, and he got it from a uh, obviously a drug addict. He was willing to take a chance. Wow. Uh, he's alive. Okay, I don't, I don't begrudge this stuff at all. I mean, we're not. I'm not in the business of telling people to go out and donate their organs. That's not 
I mean, I'm, 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 my mission is central is to stay on this issue. Uh, it's probably what I'll do for the rest of my life because the way things are going, we're not making a lot of progress here. I sort of want to slowly wrap this up. Where do you see this? I kind of see the CCP, um, you know, uh, you know, various tribal nations around the world where they hunt down an animal. You know, you've heard of the term, we use every part of the animal, the yeah. skin, the organs, the meat. And now seeing organs, seeing the hair, it looks like the CCP is trying to profit from every part of the body, from the Uyghurs' labor, from their organs, from their hair. I mean, how do we stop this horrific machine? Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. And it's something, uh, by the way, Arsene, uh, Arsene, I disagreed with my colleagues on. They sort of said, well, they don't always have to use all the organs. I said, you don't know China. I lived in China, okay? It's like, you, they're, there's a, actually a very, you know, creative aspect to Chinese culture in the sense that they use every part of every animal. How do we get around this? The best thing, uh, we've, we've obviously seen some good things happening. I mean, the Uyghur Human Rights Bill is obviously, that's, that's a big help. Uh, even, you know, even the symbolism of that, the Uyghurs have never been recognized before no. like this. This is a, a, a step forward. Some who see it as a step towards independence, I don't care what... The, you know, what step that is, it's a really important step to be recognized that way. And it didn't happen for a lot of other groups in that, in that firm way. But that's just symbolic. What we really need right now is for the medical world in the West, all the pressure should be on the medical world in the West to cut off all relationships to the surgeons in China, okay? To anybody who's involved in transplant activity, all the companies that are involved in putting in medicines, surgical techniques, uh, you, know, uh, you know, these people should not be allowed to study in our universities, they, uh, they shouldn't publish in our medical journals, they shouldn't be going to our conferences, okay? Uh, none of that, because that was what we did to the Soviet Union. When the Soviet Union, when we discovered in the West that they were uh, taking political dissidents in the Soviet Union and putting them into mental hospitals and torturing them, we denounced them. And we did not allow, we, they were dead to us. They were not allowed to participate in any of the reindeer games, okay? You, you might say, well, that's, how is that going to really affect things? Well, it will. The Chinese are, the one thing that really hurts them is face. And that's money too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that would be a dramatic shift. And if there's ever been a time to do that, it's because of the COVID crisis. It's made us really look at that medical world and say that's totally duplicitous. You know, I was, I'm writing a new book. It's, it's really mainly in the Uyghurs, and this time I'm calling it The Slaughter Two. <laughs> First book is The Slaughter Two, probably. Uh, you know, I thought, uh, you know, I thought I'd be writing history here. I'm not. Mm. Uh, this is, you know, absolutely as ongoing as anything I've ever seen. Uh, and I really hope that coming out of that, uh, the one part that I don't have to write is the deconstruction of the WHO, the World Health Organization anymore, because everybody understands they're liars and they're in the Chinese pocket. So I think that's a, that's a significant change and we have to build on that. Uh, we really do. And this is the moment. This is the Uyghur moment, actually, to step out and say these things. Uh, don't hold back. That's a, my advice would be don't hold back from the tough issues. The tendency before this was to just concentrate on the things that people understood. No, Arsla, you're right. They're using every part of the human being, okay? Every part. And this is what we have to, we can stop that, but it's going to require some new allies in the medical community, okay? Because they hold a lot of cards. Now, if they have to be pressured by the political community, that's fine. It doesn't matter, but we have to move that along. Uh, the same time, one last thing. Okay, labor, forced labor is not everything. But in this day and age, you know, look, we're all discussing slavery in the United States. Give me a break. This is slavery. It's going on right now. OK, it's this minute. It's our companies. You're buying the Apple products. OK, nobody's even talking about that. OK, this isn't some statue somewhere. OK, that represents slavery. This is the real thing. OK, the, the last Muslim canteen I saw was a picture of a Muslim canteen in 
in, in, in uh, Nike, okay? That was taken illicitly in a Nike factory, okay? Because they, you know, they don't want them to eat. And of course, you know, they're slave labor, so they can't eat with anybody else. And that's the real meaning of it. It's not a respect for religion. It's, a, it's a, uh, an attempt to further dehumanize this population. That those companies are out there. That study is a great start. Okay. Uh, we need more like that. We need to really make the corporate world start paying a price for this, this sort of thing. They can't, this can't go on anymore. This isn't a growing pains issue for China anymore. Uh, I'm not sure how you lean politically, whether right or left, but as you mentioned, um, the, the BLM movement, if they, you know, want to want reparations or, you know, want to bring up slavery. I mean, we've got modern day slavery right here, right now happening. Stand up for that because as you mentioned, like, I don't want to sound too politically incorrect, but slavery is over, dude. Like, I don't know how you, how you deal with that, but for Uyghurs, it's like, you got concentration camps for slaver, slavery, organ harvesting. I mean, back us up here. You, you, you guys have the manpower. I mean, bring this to light, basically. The last few moments, I want you to sort of, you mentioned that you've got the slaughter part two. Obviously, slaughter one essentially is out there. Um, I'll have you basically plug your book. Uh, tell us a little bit about it and where people can get it. And then I obviously want you back one day again. I, I've got it on screen, basically. You don't need oh, to. Here's another. There you go. <laughs> right, right, right in the living, living flesh. Uh, I just pulled it off the bookshelf. Yeah. Uh, no, this one's available on Amazon. And you can also, if you buy the uh, PDF, the e-copy, I get a little extra money, actually. I'd make less on the actual book. But uh, it's a very good read. It's a little bit, it's a little long in tooth now. It's 2014. But yeah, uh, but it does tell you the background. The first chapter, in fact, starts with the Uyghurs. It starts with Enver Tonti's story and several other wow. Uyghur stories uh, because the Uyghurs were the experimental population. And that's where I wanted to go with your, actually, your point here. You see, the danger is, goes beyond the Uyghurs. And the, the I mean, I know that sounds terrible, but to go, it goes beyond the fate of the Uyghurs. You know, this is, what do you think was happening partly with the Jews? I mean, this was set up for what they were looking to do with a large part of Russia. Okay, a large part of Russia was gonna be turned into sort of a combination of concentration camps and slave labor uh, factories. OK, yeah. they were going to depopulate that population. Uh, some of them, they probably would have used gas chambers. Some of them, they would have done some other methods or just starved them. But they were looking for sort of rational and industrial ways to do this. OK. Similarly, anyone looking at Hong Kong now has to say, are you the next population on this? If Taiwan were to fall, they very quickly become the new Xinjiang, I think the new East Turkestan. I mean, this would be, uh, these are trial balloons. This is, the Uyghur population by Chinese standards is tiny. You know, even if it's only 15, you know, 15 million, that's nothing. Which hotel are they staying at, as they used to say? Uh, the, they are looking to do this on a broad scale, I believe. And so everything that's being tried out the, from the surveillance and the ethnic surveillance, the actual ability of the camera to read whether a person is Han Chinese or Uyghur, to read the skin so they can see signs of tension on the skin, signs that you and I, even with our beautiful human eyes and our fantastic perception, can't read signs of tension just from the way the capillaries move, uh, work. That's, this is the real stuff. And the whole world should be looking at this problem. Uh, no, I don't think, look, honestly, I don't know, you know, I think the, the whole Black Lives Matter thing, I think there's a cyclical thing. America goes through it from time to time. I don't think that's the issue. I think the issue here is that we really, uh, in a sense, America's having a kind of a last gasp of kind of old familiar conflicts before we get into this very new one, because we have entered a Cold War with China. Mm. And nobody can deny it anymore. We, we don't like that. By the way, as Americans, we hate that moment where it happens. But the fall of Hong Kong, uh, what's happening with the Uyghurs, uh, the threats to Taiwan, uh, uh, the, the South China Sea, this is all becoming very apparent uh, that we're in this new, uh, new era. 
Uh, you mentioned we, a moment. You mentioned a moment ago, a moment ago with the essentially the new security law. Hong Kongers have noticed pretty much, you know, on the other side of China, they've noticed that they are going to see the fate of uh, of what the Uyghurs are going through with them. Let's quickly hear what a protester had to say. Hongkong,今日新疆明日香港,好日就是台湾的。我们共产党,对香港呢,不会守远的,同我的一样。我们全力对抗共产党。如果在这个世界上,你还有一个自由的人民的话, 請到我們香港一起對抗共產黨,被德國納粹還要嚴重,在現在這個二千千年這麼多年之後都還是這麼過分地對自由之民的政府,我們一定要打敗共產黨。I'm just going to stop it there, where he says we have to defeat the Communist Party, the time is now. Last words from you, Mr. Ethan uh, Gutman, and then I'll close off the show. No, I mean, they're not great words for the Uyghurs, I'm afraid, but I mean, I'll just make this comment about Hong Kong very quickly. You know, I'm half, uh, I'm a dual citizen of the UK and, and US at this point, um, <laughs> both passports and so forth. And I'm so proud of the UK for accepting, they'll be accepting 3 million Hong Kong, half, basically half of Hong Kong will be going to the uh, UK. And I know they're not happy to leave their homes. This is a terrible thing. Uh, and for the Uyghurs, uh, they'll never go back to that country. I mean, it'll never be the same. Okay, it's, So much has been destroyed. So much of the culture has been ripped apart. For the families, what's the, 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 this, this will ripple through generations after generations after generations. And this is a this is the terrible tragedy of this is even when it ends where the even if the Communist Party were to fall tomorrow, the rebuilding is going to be so awful. Uh, so I have very little good to say about that, except that uh, there's another thing I'm I've been really proud of, which is I've been very proud to associate with Uyghur and Kazakh activists throughout this process. It's been a real honor. It's been the people People of great courage, tremendous bravery. Uh, I don't consider myself to be in a class like that, I'm, but I'm, I'm, I feel lucky in my life to have been able to to work with people like this. And, and some Falun Gong too, I want to add. I mean, there's been, uh, it's been the high point of my life. So, leave it there. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you so much. I hope to have you back to talk about other issues in the future. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. Make sure you share this video, like it, spread the word, do your bit. I mean, a social media is such an important tool for people that underestimate the power of social media. Ask yourself, why is Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, these things we take for granted each and every day banned in China? And with that, I'll leave you. Peace be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you so much, Ethan Goodman. Hope to have you in the future. Thank you.